We're privileged to have as our second speaker, Emeritus Professor Will Steffen, a globally renowned Earth System scientist whom I first met when he was directing the International Geosphere Biosphere Program. He has many distinctions. He's a climate counsellor of the Climate Council of Australia and Emeritus Professor at ANU, the scientist from heaven. Welcome, Will Steffen. Well, that's a really tough introduction to follow on from me. And, but uh, what I want to do is go up a little bit in scale now. Uh, we've been talking a lot about Australia as a continent and sub scales of that. But I want to talk about the planet, the planet as a whole and how we think now about managing not only Australia, but our planetary home, more importantly, managing ourselves. So my uh, basic topic here, my basic theme is that this planet is a single system. Notice that we don't say Earth systems scientists, we say Earth system science in the singular. It's a singular planetary system when viewed from outer space like this. So we need to understand how it functions and how it's changing. And to do that, we can use what's called the Holocene reference point. Um, Nicole was just talking about uh, times back here, I'll put it up here. 40,000 years ago and so on. And you can see what a difficult, cold, dry, erratic climate that indigenous Australians and the rest of humans in this time had to deal with. Then we had a sharp increase in temperature and we have this steady period here uh, for about 12,000 years. It's the only time we've had agriculture, by the way, on the planet. Uh, and we have had only in the last couple thousand years, these large civilizations forming around the planet. So this is really the planetary sweet spot. It's called the Holocene. And as Nicole said, this long period before it goes back a couple million years is called the Pleistocene. So that's our reference point for what we consider to be a, a good climate on this planet. But what's happened to that? Something called the Great Acceleration. So this graph here is the 12,000 years of the Holocene. I'm, I'm putting three things associated with humans here. The three things that are most important, how many we are, our population, but not only that, how much we are consuming or how much energy we are using and the size of our economies, GDP. Look what happened. Very stable throughout the entire Holocene until the last few hundred years. And then it is skyrocketed. When we look at the last uh, period from 1670 to the present and, and look at this in more detail, here you see the three population, energy, economy. It's since the mid 20th century that we've exploded thing called the Great Acceleration. This is so profound in terms of its impact on the Earth that geologists and Earth system scientists have now proposed a new epoch, the Anthropocene. And this is the Anthropocene-Holocene boundary. So I was born in 1947. I was born in the Holocene, but I've lived most of my life in the Anthropocene. My daughter was born only in the Anthropocene. That's all she knows. So we are living in a completely unique time in the history of Homo sapiens. Let's look at the last 2000 years now of the Holocene and this late Holocene baseline. These are reconstructions of temperature through that period. And you can see the individual temperature records. It's within a very tight envelope. Doesn't vary by more than one or two tenths of a degree. Look at this spike at the end. That's the human influence, mainly since 1950, since the explosion, the explosion of activity uh, associated with a great acceleration. And this is some of the most profound evidence that we have left the Holocene in a very abrupt way and entered the Anthropocene. The rates of change are phenomenal here. If you look at these, rate of atmospheric CO2 concentration, the last couple of decades, over a hundred times the maximum rate when the earth came out of the last ice age, which was very steep in geological time. Last half century, global average temperature has risen at a rate about 200 times faster than the background rate over the past 7,000 years. This last comment from the geologists is really important, I think. These current rates of CO2 and temperature change, these are fundamental indicator, indicators for the state of the Earth system. These two are unprecedented or almost unprecedented in the entire 4.5 billion year history of this planet. Only one other time did temperature change this fast, and that was when the meteorite struck, uh, struck about 66 million years ago and knocked out the dinosaurs. And the temperature went in the other way. It got cold very fast. So we can say now with high confidence that the earth has never warmed at the rate it's warming now in the entire 4.5 billion year history. 
That's how much we humans are actually changing things. But we've, tra we've transformed the biosphere uh, just as much. And in fact, the theme of this conference, agriculture is more important than climate change in transforming the biosphere right around the planet. I'm not gonna go into much detail, but I'll give you the, the sort of the high end. Uh, this comes from, a, from work, the equivalent of the IPCC for the biosphere published in 2019. Nature is declining at rates globally that are unprecedented in history, at least since human history has been on here. About 1 million animal and plant species, and that's out of about 8 uh, million, are now threatened with extinction, many within decades. So it is accurate to say we have entered the sixth great extinction event. The web of life on Earth is getting smaller and increasingly frayed. And you can see that right throughout scales. What Nicole showed in Southwest WA is repeated time and time and time and time again, all around the planet, on every continent. And this is the result. The web of life is getting increasingly frayed and is getting smaller. These, this, these sort of observations are the basis for the fact that we have entered the Anthropocene, a new epoch in Earth history and one that is still very unstable. The Holocene was stable for 12,000 years. We don't know yet where the Anthropocene is gonna end up. It's a very rapid and accelerating, accelerating tra trajectory out of stable conditions. Well, one of the tools that scientists have developed to try to guide us as to how we must change our relationship with the rest of this planet is something called planetary boundaries. What we tried to do with planetary boundaries was to say, how much can we change this planet and stay within a stable Holocene-like condition? So these are scientifically based levels of human perturbation of the Earth system beyond which the functioning is significantly altered. The framework doesn't actually tell us how we should deal with this problem. It just tells us the nature and the magnitude of the problem. But it does identify a safe, uh, safe operating space for us on Earth. So it does make a valuable contribution, we think, to decision-making at the planetary scale. This is sort of our famous radar diagram. What are the planetary boundaries? Well, we identified nine processes that together identify the state of the Earth system. You can see some famous ones as climate change in here, uh, biosphere integrity. Those are the two really important ones, biogeochemical flows, freshwater use, and so on. But if we could keep th these nine within this inner circle, we would have a Holocene-like state. You can see visually we're way outside of that. And worse yet, we're accelerating away from the Holocene at an increasing rate. That's the data. You don't need to read that. In the 2015 update, we said climate change and biosphere integrity were now identified as the two out of the nine that are absolutely key. We call them core planetary boundaries because transgressing either or both of these could drive the Earth system on, its, on their own into a new distinct state. Notice that both climate and biosphere integrity have been transgressed which is why we are saying we are now in the Anthropocene and not in the Holocene. So this is consistent with what the geologist is saying. Well, what about agriculture and the planetary boundaries? Agriculture is hugely important. That's why this meeting and a lot of the good ideas for transforming agriculture are important. Interestingly, agriculture is the primary driver of the transgression of four of the nine planetary boundaries. That's a big proportion of them. Biosphere integrity, which is a core boundary, most of land system change around the entire planet is driven by agriculture. Obviously, phosphorus and nitrogen enormously transgress that boundary. Why? Fertilization. Land system change, that's a subset of biosphere integrity. Freshwater use, 70% or so of all human freshwater use is for agriculture. Only 10 or 20% for urban, urban uses. And it makes significant contributions to a couple other ones. So I absolutely agree with everything that's being said here, that sustainable agriculture is hugely important at local and regional scales. It's hugely important at the earth system scale as well, just as important as energy systems, which are also extremely important. One of the things we don't do well with planetary boundaries is the fact that we've got nine of them, but they all interact. This is hideously difficult science to deal with, but we're talking about the earth as a single system. So they're all interacting. Some people have had a go at looking at how all of these uh, are linked together. The biosphere integrity uh, core boundary is an important one. And we use something called a biosphere intactness index, 
Uh, that's, a, that's a judgment. It's not really a, a strong quantitative index, a judgment as to how the biosphere is changing, how we're changing biodiversity, how indigenous cultures have set a baseline with a well-functioning biosphere that we are now changing quite dramatically. We look at water availability, we look at impacts on human health. So it's it's these nine boundaries are nice and easy to get your head around, but we're saying the Earth system is far more complex than that, and we do have to deal with that. We're working now on, on an update, which will be published later this year of the planetary boundaries. Here are the, the key findings. There will now be three core boundaries, an additional one of what we call novel entities. That's new stuff, chemicals, radioactive materials that we are shoving into the biosphere at an enormous rate without even testing. It's a shocker when you actually look at the data that's coming out. We are completely covering this planet with novel entities and in the atmosphere and in the ocean. We had four planetary boundaries that were transgressed in 2015. Now at least six and possibly even eight of the nine will be transgressed. All three core boundaries are transgressed. And for most of the boundaries, we are actually moving deeper into the red zone. In other words, the rate of transgression is increasing. So the summary of what's gonna come out this year, 2022, is the earth system is being destabilized at an increasing rate, which is telling us that all the efforts we've made on climate change, biosphere uh, protection and so on, are failing. We're going in the wrong direction. Well, how do we try to turn this around? And there've been a lot of efforts internationally to govern what's called the global commons. We've seen this before, the UN Sustainable Development Goals, which is really a great opportunity for putting the whole picture together. The, the global goals here suffer the same problem that the planetary boundaries do. And here you see 17 individual goals that cover the natural environment, human societies, and so on. And they're all treated individually. And when you unpack them, some of them are mutually inconsistent. So again, it's trying to decompose a single complex system, planet Earth, into something that's tractable, but you miss really important interactions when you do that. So that really brings this question, how are we actually going to achieve this? Well, we can't achieve it by looking at each one of them individually. Here's some ideas on how we might go forward. One of the best ones I know of is Kate Rayworth, who's an economist from Oxford University in the UK. So what she's done here is she said, there is a ceiling, there is a limit to how much we should change the Earth system. And she's using the nine, these are the nine planetary boundaries, saying to date, this is probably the best, most robust metric we have for saying how far we should push the Earth system. In fact, I would say we've now transgressed six or eight of them. So it's a question of how do we get back down within the boundaries? And she said, there's a social foundation, that's the inner part of her donut here. And this is what's required for having a good, well-functioning human society. And the trick is we have to develop economies that actually live within this donut, that deliver much better outcomes for humans, but live within the planetary boundaries of a well-functioning Earth system. We are a long, long way from getting there. But in fact, what we need are people like Kate who shake up the economics business and say, you know, you neoliberal econo economists have it entirely wrong. You're the problem, not the solution. But then she comes with a solution. So what are some of the things at the core of Kate's idea? It's always systems thinking. It's not cause effect logic. It's dynamic complexity that we need to think about. We need to develop for us humans an economic system that, is, that deals, delivers equity by design. Right now, our economic system delivers inequality. After the fact, we try to fix it up being taxes and subsidies and so on. She says we need to design an economic system that delivers equity so you don't have to fiddle with it afterwards. And of course, the biosphere, as we've heard before, must become regenerative by design. That's the only way you can make a profit on the land is by regenerating. And you need to rejig, rejig the governance system and the economic system to do this. So these are profound changes. These are fundamental changes that she's arguing for. One of the most innovative ideas that's come out of the international community for decades comes from uh, a lawyer in Portugal named Paulo Magalhães. And he's developed this idea of the common home for humanity. And he says, what we're lacking is there's no recognition legally or in any governance system of the earth system. What is the earth? Look at a map. It's divided into nation states, all right? And economic zones of the coastal seas and so on. What's left? A few bits and pieces, which are the global commons. And he says, this is total rubbish. We need to legally 
recognize the earth system, the intangible part, which, to, which provides our life support system, the flows of energy, the flows of materials, the, all the feedback ne- mechanisms that keep a well-functioning earth. And we need to recognize that legally because if we don't recognize it legally, we'll continue to abuse it bit by bit, piece by piece. He's getting some traction now. This has gone up to the UN, being fought tooth and nail by a lot of economists, and you might guess some big countries that make a lot of money out of plundering the planet. But this is the way we've got to go forward. We've got to actually legally recognize it. I'm going to close here and allow some time for discussion, but I want to go back to, uh, I think, what the core message is here, is this isn't really an issue about changing technologies. This isn't an issue about changing economic systems. This is changing, this is changing our core values uh, and our view of who we are and what we're doing on this planet. The others will follow if we do that. And I think indigenous peoples around the world uh, have a history of learning how to live with this planet uh, and live in a long-term sustainable way. Um, I'm just uh, using a quote from uh, Southwest WA from an elder from the Nyungar people. But it's one that I really like. Uh, because it captures their system science. It says we're only here for a short amount of time to do what we've been put here to do, which is to look after the country, not to make a big profit, not to live in a bigger house, not to have, a, uh, uh, I don't know how many holidays overseas, flying overseas. That's not the role. You know, what we're really supposed to do is look after the country. And I interpret that in my profession as looking after the Earth system. We're only a tool in the cycle of things. Notice this emphasis on cycle. That's systems thinking cycle of things. We go out into the world and help keep the balance of nature. Again, this is, this is cyclical thinking, system dynamics, and so on. It's a big cycle of living with the land and then eventually going back to it. So this is good advice for Southwest WA. It's a good advice for Australia. It's a good advice for planet Earth and the Earth system. So I'm going to stop there, Ian, um, perhaps get us back on time a bit and allow some questions. <clears throat> Thanks so much, Will. Questions from an orderly queue on the right, please. <laughs> I see a difficult one coming up. <laughs> no, just big picture. I love what you and, and Nicole just shared. I honestly feel like should have gone first because you guys set it up. And I just really, it just hit the nail on the head, the earth systems and also looking back in the cycles of humanity. Those are the two keys if we want to stop rep- repeating the damage we've done. So I just, I loved it. I loved it. It was great. Um, Okay, because we know, as I said yesterday, that climate is built by plants processing thermal heat and water, and because we know that Australia had a very unique floodplain system and a very, like, an extremely intricate uh, way of processing water and had its own set of natural sequence and patterns... Uh, You can probably tell I work with Peter Andrews, so natural sequence comes up a lot. But when you're looking at the landscape and you're looking at these patterns and these sequences, I'm just wondering why we haven't actually been discussing those at all when we talk about regenerative, restorative Australian agriculture. Yeah, look, I I totally agree with that because that's bringing more systems thinking into into what we need to do. Um, Yeah, I, you know... I, I look around a lot when I travel around this continent and I can just recall driving from um, Alice Springs out to Uluru and seeing a lot of fairly trashed landscape uh, with a bunch of camels running around it. And then, and then go, do, do the Marini loop through indigenous country, which looked much in much better condition, even though the same rainfall, same climate, so on. So yeah, we got to learn. We got to learn how exactly, as you say, think more deeply about how we uh, live with this continent rather than trying to exploit it. Um, it, it was great to see this this quote finishing up your your um, presentation there, Will. Um, my my question, I guess, links to this in that what we've heard a lot about over the last two days is is that quite frankly, the West has demonstrated that it's not able to respond to these sorts of challenges and problems, and that we're quite reticent in, in doing something about that. Um, traditional owners, First Nations people right around the globe still have knowledge and understanding of systems that work in landscapes that live within the means of those. Should we be placing more? What opportunity is there for us to actually respond to some of these problems by placing traditional owners and First Nations more centrally in decision-making about our responses? I would absolutely agree with that. Um, 
And I think we could start with the Uluru statement from the heart that we need a voice of Indigenous people and we need to listen to it. Well, well I should therefore say, Nangaja Apu Wea Ngaiko Jamo, which means that is not a rock. It is my grandfather. I walked around Uluru for Jinani, Anani for two years. I took the last South African ambassador and therefore first rejoined to the Commonwealth. High Commissioner on tour, and he invited me with, that was Norde and his wife, Willem in Spain, last of the Boer um, of the apartheid. And so I had photographs from the residents of the old flag and therefore the new rainbow flag. So I then, after those two years, moved to Mbantwa, which is Aranda. So I went from Jukapa Law to Aranda. So I can say Werta, which means the sign language, what I'm frustrated by, because Nunga people, Nunga means man in Wonkaning. And so there's no yok, there's no yoga. I can say to you, Kaya, Nunuk Murij, meaning, hi, but hey, are you good? I mean, I have a house in Kulanga. Kulanga comes from Kulanga, which means children. Up the suffix means lake. There's right beside Lake Kulanga, it's a children's lake. So, is there a question? Well, the frustration is that how many dialect uh, languages or dialects of this continent do you know other than another dialect of English that you can competently cross-culturally speak in that, you know, language and culture are intrinsically linked from this land? Language, land, language and law. No, very good point. Um, no, I, I speak an odd sort of trans-Pacific mix of English between Australian and North American, and I speak some Swedish up to the other side of the world. So, uh, but unfortunately, yes, yeah, I mean, I, I, was, I, was, I, was, I was born and raised in Central USA, um, about as far away from anything as interesting as you might, you know, uh, as you might think about. Yeah, so obviously I come out of that, that, that part of the world. That's what my education is. I'm always trying to learn, even though I'm an old bloke now, an old white fella, uh, but I am trying to learn as I go along. So uh, I hope um, my Indigenous colleagues don't mind that I try to draw from some of the knowledge that they're providing that I think we ought to listen, ought to, listen to. Yeah, I'd love to be able to speak at least one or two languages. Maybe I'll try. Okay. Uh, hello, um, Paul Kavanagh from Boroa, and um, thank you, Will. And uh, the theme of my question is, and I wish I could say it in another language, but I can only speak Boroanese, but if I had, is don't shit in your own backyard. Um, I still remember my um, lex early morning lectures, nine o'clock at Sydney Uni, that with B.R. Davidson talking about the, um, the irrigation scheme or the old river scheme which the way that they stopped um, the uh, new um, landholders and developers of the irrigation plan from dirtying their own water was to make sure that you pulled your water from below where you stuck it back into the, to the river. Um, do you, can you see other feedback loops besides putting a giant cork in the septic um, system of Sydney or wherever other village or town that um, uh, would sort of bring, it, bring the, the fact that the, the pollution, the excesses and everything to the fore? Yeah, look, I think the best thing is we need to stop the pollution at the source. Um, and I think we need to restore as many as much free flowing water as we possibly can, stop damming it and so on. I think there's this whole idea of not just a, a regenerative, a restorative agriculture, but I think regenerating landscapes and, and hydrological systems too um, is very important. One of the nicest things I've seen in, in a film from Western USA uh, is um, some indigenous Americans finally got the okay to blow up a big dam and and let one of the salmon rivers flow again. Uh, it was actually a lovely thing to see. Thanks very much, Will. Pleasure.